Okay, so first of all, I want to welcome um, everyone and thank the organizers for having uh, both myself and Dr. Hong, who um, hopefully will be able to join us later on. Um, the topic of discussion today is ablative radiation for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. carcinoma. Um, I'm, we're going to be tackling current status, uh, current status and future directions um, in my talk today. So as um, many of you are aware, intrahepatic cholangios represent approximately 12% of primary cancers arising within the liver itself. Although the number and incidence at large, both in the United States and uh, worldwide has been rising over the last four decades. And currently surgical resection really offers the best chance of cure. However, unfortunately, many patients are unable to undergo surgical resection. Um, at presentation, and the standard of care for unresectable cholangiocarcinoma currently is to proceed with chemotherapy. Um, gemcitabine and cisplatin has been established as one reasonable standard of care per ABCO2, um, and more recent data has looked at a triplet combination of gemcitabine, cisplatin, and embraxane. The role of radiation has been more uh, recently um, investigated and radiation has been associated with high rates of local control in hepatocellular cancer, um, as well as liver metastases. So, you know, one of the questions that was naturally raised is, can radiation lead to long-term local control and thus survival in patients with intrahepatic meningios? And this is just the NCCN guidelines that was um, published earlier this year online. And you can see if you follow uh, the paradigm, the flow chart, um, if disease is resectable, then it should be uh, considered for uh, staging laparoscopy and resection. However, for unresectable disease, um, you know, molecular testing, MSI testing is recommended. And then options all listed with no, um, with no particular order is clinical, uh, clinical trial, systemic therapy. And they do have on there radiation with concurrent 5-FU as, as well as other local regional therapies like SPRT. Um, and arterially directed therapies, as well as best supportive care. So it really does suggest that there's role for these liver directed therapies. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the metastatic paradigm, similarly, uh, liver directed therapies are also reported here, and I'm gonna go over some of, all, uh, some of the data that supports that. So this is just the ABCO2 trial, like I, I, as I had described earlier, where you can see gem cytopene um, versus uh, gemcis versus gemcitabine alone, there was a hazard ratio of 0.64 that was statistically significant that translated to an improvement in median survival by about three, four months. And this is the response rate of these two drug regimens. Um, you can see gemcis improved response rates approximately 26% versus approximately 16% in those treated with gemcitabine alone. Um, also, once again, uh, significantly different. And then I, as I mentioned, this is the most recent data looking at gemcisabraxane. It's a phase two study of 62 patients with advanced biliary tract tumors treated at two institutions where the partial response rate was 45% and the disease control rate of 84%. And there was a randomized trial ongoing looking at the kind of direct comparison of gemcisabraxane versus gemcisitabine at this time. So where does radiation play into this? Well, historically, radiation to the liver was really shied away from, and that was in part because they were limited by techniques and concern for toxicity. There was an early paper in the 1960s that really really metastatic disease, and when um, patients were uh, underwent biopsies, they found that seven of the 12 patients had uh, hyperemia and fibrin deposition in central veins. Um, those were these years. So when we looked at, uh, we looked at um, risk of radiation-induced liver disease, it's not similar to the idea of partial hepatitis.
spare reasonable venom liver. But when you're talking about a whole liver where there's no liver spared, that's when you can run into issues. So that, that this is a chart um, from a review article from Laura Dawson, who's been really seminal in terms of moving the radiation oncology treatment uh, um, field forward in terms of liver radiation, that you can treat a third of the liver to nearly 90 to 100 gray with the same toxicity as you can treat for a whole liver to 30 gray. So the volume is critical in terms of um, what you're treating and what you're able to spare in terms of the prediction of toxicity. So what else has uh, led to changes in adoption of liver radiation? Well, there's been significant technological advancements that have enabled um, the uptick of liver radiation. One is just improved target delineation um, techniques. So now we routinely have MRIs that we can fuse into our 3D um, CT-based planning systems. So all of my liver radiation places, cases I do um, fuse in and, um, and we can fuse in multiple different sequencing to optimize target delineation, um, as well as uh, using IV contrast at time at CT planning. Uh, in addition, there's now MRI-based Linux that allow us to do uh, an MRI-based CT planning, uh, MRI-based planning that allows us better delineation of the tumor itself. In addition, we know that the liver lies right underneath the diaphragm, and so therefore it moves with respiration. And how do we manage that kind of respiratory motion, and how do we evaluate it? Well, now we routinely do 4D. Uh, CT planning, which once again takes into account the respiratory cycle and evaluation of real-time breathing. Um, for patients that have significant um, motion with respiration, there are techniques we can do, which is one called active breathing control, where you try to coach patients to have um, optimized ways to breathe to minimize motion um, and, and to control the breathing. And then also patients sometimes can have abdominal compression in this image to the right is just a picture. Uh, the top is actually active breathing control and the one to the bottom is abdominal compression. Um, and that is so that there's some patients with abdominal compression have less breathing motion. And then also one other additional technique uh, we've uh, developed is res respiratory gating where you're treating only at specific cycles um, of respiration to really minimize um, target variability in terms of location. Um, that does increase the treatment time overall, but it, it is one very effective way at uh, motion management. In addition, in terms of the uh, daily radiation targeting, we now routinely put liver fiducials, which are little gold seeds right in and around the tumor itself. It's a very similar procedure to a biopsy, except instead of dropping something in, you take, uh, instead of taking something out as a biopsy does, you drop something in. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, we also perform pre-treatment cone beam CTs. And this is just a picture of a cone beam CT where we line up um, the pre-treatment plans, uh, planning scan to the, um, the cone beam CT of that particular day. And we can line up the fiducials and line up the contours of the liver edge, as well as the other normal structures, the spine, um, to, for tar a target verification. And then lastly, just the treatment planning systems and the treatment delivery systems are so much more sophisticated nowadays that really allow for very, very accurate targeting of the lesions themselves um, and allow for high doses of radiation to be delivered um, in a time efficient manner. So all of these uh, technological uh, advancements led to the emergence of liver SBRT, SBRT standing for stereotactic body radiation therapy, are also known as SABER, which is stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy. These terms are really used interchangeably. And this is a sophisticated radiation technique that uses multiple non-coplanar uh, beams or arcs that delivers highly conformal radiation and ablative, uh, ablative radiation doses, typically administers, uh, administered in five or less fractions. Um, there are ways um, to do hypofractionated, still larger doses per day. Um, but somewhere on the order of six to 15 fractions as well. And you can see that um, those different fractionation schemas over the more recent literature. So this is just a representative photon plan of a patient that I treated greater than 10 centimeter intrahepatic cholangia that was felt to be unresectable. And you can see that the orange is the area that we're getting the target dose to 5805. 
Um, and then you can see cooling down of dosing um, with a real goal to spare uninvolved liver here, um, segment two and three, down here inferior to the treatment area, as well as sparing and shaping the dose around the heart, um, the kidneys, the stomach, um, and the bowel. So um, this is one of the first papers that was published that really um, moved the idea of radiation for intrahepatic calandios mainstream. And this is from MD Anderson. And it was uh, their experience of 79 patients treated uh, consecutively between 2002 and 2015. Um, you can see the median tumor size was 7.9 centimeters with a range of 2.2 to 17 centimeters. Once again, these are unresectable lesions, so many of them in very difficult locations. And 89% received prior chemotherapy. Um, and this is just an uh, image of how they actually dosed the tumor. Um, they did simultaneous integrated boosts where different areas of the tumor got differential dosing on each individual day. So you can see that blue area got up to 100 gray in the tumor center. The periphery, the red line got about 75 gray. And then once you got closer to organs at risk, like the stomach, the heart, um, they actually they dose reduced it down to 45 gray. Um, and they found that the range of the radiation dose schema during this period of time in this um, retrospective series was 35 to 100 gray and three to 30 fractions with a median BED or a biologic effective dose of 80.5. And so they had a median follow-up of 33 months and a median overall survival of 30 months in their series with a three-year overall survival of 44%. And this is actually compared to historical controls of patients who are found to have unresectable disease. This was found to be quite promising. And when they looked at prognostic factors, the most, single most prognostic factor of anything was actually radiation dose administered. And you can see that for patients who received a biologic effective dose of less than or equal to 80.5, uh, great, was 38% uh, three-year survival versus 73% when they had higher BEDs statistically significant. And then this, uh, this is in large part due to the improvement in local control that you can see here, 45% versus 78% um, at three years, also significant. And these are just the Kaplan-Meier curves really showing the difference of BED and, um, and the recognition of the importance of dose in trying to control that local tumor. When we looked at MD Anderson's experience in terms of how patients, what were the causes of death, you can see that the majority of patients that um, and ended up dying died of, um, of liver-related causes, um, biliary complications, vascular complications, um, and parenchymal liver failure. And you can see that this really probably drove the difference in overall survival. Um, it's always hard um, especially for biliary tumors to differentiate treatment-related toxicity versus um, biliary failures uh, or biliary progression of disease. But where many of these patients did have known progression, um, it's very much felt that it's due to actually uncontrolled primaries. Um, and this is one of the first studies that also really is, shows compelling data that um, you know, controlling liver disease and preventing biliary complications is actually quite an important goal separate of um, the cancer itself, just because of the importance of maintaining biliary patency. So the next study published uh, just shortly after um, the MD Anderson experience um, was a phase two study from um, our institution, Mass General, MD Anderson and UPenn, looking at protons in the setting. Um, it was a multi-center single arm study um, and the sample size was calculated to demonstrate a greater than 80% local control at two years. And you can see the eligibility listed below, no cirrhosis, um, child's QA um, or B patients, um, generally good performance status patients, although we did include patients up to ECOG performance status too, no extra hepatic disease, no prior radiation, and a maximal tumor size of 12 centimeters. Um, so proton radiotherapy, as many of you may know, um, has garnered a lot of attention over the last decade or so. A lot of randomized trials looking at proton versus photon in multiple disease, prostate, lung, um, liver, for hepatocellular cancer. And the reason why there's compelling interest in proton radiotherapy is because 
um, protons are particles with charge and mass, and it has particular um, characteristics where um, you have this dose deposit with a sharp bragg peak, and then beyond that point, there is no additional radiation. And so this is a um, an image to the right of, of a, you know, pediatric patient receiving cranial spinal radiation, and you can see. If you look at the DS, which is double scattered protons, you can see there's a abrupt drop off beyond the vertebral bodies in which there's no anterior structures that receive radiation dose. That's in direct contrast to the photon based radiation, which there continues to be dose de a deposition due to um, uh, X ray exit from um, beyond the target, uh, target tissue. And so you know, in liver tumors, there's this compelling thought that, well, it, you know, you want to spare as much liver, non-irradiated liver as possible. And so is there a role for protons? So that's what we looked at. Um, and patients on this particular study received hypofractionated, but not SBRT. It was 15 fractions. And peripheral lesions got 67.5 gray. And anything within two centimeters, the porta hepatis got 5805 gray uh, within 15 fractions. And this is just a representative um, plan for a proton patient. And you can see, once again, um, using multiple beam angles, they're able to spare nicely uninvolved parts of the liver as well as the heart. This is just a summary of the tumor characteristics of the 39 patients treated with intrahepatic lantio. Of note, two of these had mixed histology. Um, and you can see that 28% you know, had uh, tumor vascular thrombus. Um, and, um, you know, that the median uh, tumor dimension was about um, six centimeters. When we looked at radiation-related toxicity, um, we actually found that this was extremely well tolerated. There was only a 4% rate of three plus, grade three plus toxicity. Um, one patient who had hypervilirubinemia, one patient who developed um, stomach ulcer, and one patient who developed both liver failure and ascites. Um, there was no grade four radiation uh, toxicity. So once again, we had um, accepted patients up to child QC, um, ECOG performance status of two. Um, some of our patients were 80, 90 on the study. Um, so really a quite gentle uh, treatment option for these patients that don't have other options. When we looked at patterns of failure, you can see that for the intrahepatic cholangio cohort, the majority of patients did develop ultimately distant metastatic disease, and that's continually uh, a recurring theme. Um, and one of the limitations of liver-directed therapy that um, out-of-field failure remains and continues to be a big competing risk. Um, although in this study, there was a subset that developed local failures, um, ultimately six out of the 39 developed uh, um, progression of uh, local progression. These are the Kaplan-Meier curves. The two-year overall survival for intrahepatic cholangia was 46.5%. And then this is the local control. You can see the local control rates were pretty uh, good up until tw uh, 24 months. There were some failures that occurred later after 24 months. We don't see that so much in HCC. Um, and this two-year local control was about 94%. We've more recently updated our experience. Um, of patients just treated at M uh, MGH, and this is 66 patients treated with the exact same fractionation with the standard um, radiation. The median age of this um, of our patients was 76, but ranged up to 92 years, um, and 41% were greater than 80 years. Once again, suggesting that this is a, a very reasonable and well tolerated option for uh, elderly patients that may not be eligible or amenable to. Um, uh, liver, uh, a partial hepatectomy. The median tumor diameter was 5.6 centimeters. The median radiation dose was 5805, as in the previous study. And then in our particular study, 23% had metastatic disease and 77% 70 70 had local only disease. Um, and 32 received proton radiotherapy and the, and the rest received photon radiotherapy. Um, so this is just an MGH um, updated uh, continuation of the updated experience. The median follow-up from diagnosis was 21 months. Median follow-up of radiation start was 15 months. Um, and 7.6% ultimately developed local failure. Of this, the two-year local uh, control rate was 84% for 
for the entire cohort, the two-year overall survival is 58%. And then among patients with localized disease, if we exclude the metastatic patients, the two-year local control was 93%, um, and the two-year overall survival was 62%. So really, among patients who have radiation that treated in this hypofractionated fashion, um, among localized disease, it's more, I tell my patients, it's more than 90% likely that they will have control of that lesion at two years, which is um, you know, very good for the toxicity. So with an updated toxicity, we found 11% grade three plus toxicity. Only one patient developed radiation-induced liver disease, um, and they were treated with steroids with improvement. Um, of no subsequent biliary inter intervention was required for 39% of the patients. Um, once again, hard to differentiate between tumor progression and um, treatment toxicity. When we looked at multivariate analysis for outcomes, um, and causes of death, we found that local control was, um, for local control, age of diagnosis, having prior surgery and vascular, a micro, a macrovascular invasion were predictors of local control. In terms of overall survival, generally women fared better prior chemotherapy, and there was a sense that perhaps patients with protons may have a trend towards improved survival. Um, when we look at causes of death in our, for our 45, for, for 45 of our patients who uh, ultimately died. Um, once again, the main competing risk was metastatic disease, um, although there were a subset that died from bili uh, biliary complications. So I'm gonna move now into the metastatic setting. Um, and as I mentioned in the NCCN, they do have actually radiation liver-directed therapies as a consideration. And there is also emerging data that um, there may be a role for radiation um, for intrahepatic glandios. And once again, I think the crux of the issue comes down to biliary control, as that is the main competing risk for this uh, patient population beyond metastatic disease. Um, so this is an NCDB study that was just published last year in JAMA Open Network of 2,000 plus patients um, with metastatic intrahepatic glandio uh, diagnosed between 2004 and 2014. Um, all were treated with chemotherapy, but 95% were treated with chemotherapy alone. Um, ultimately, 4.7% were treated with, um, in addition, liver-directed therapies. Of that, 73% also had surgery, and 27% of the 104 patients received radiation. Of note, these were not balanced arms. Patients treated with chemotherapy alone were more likely to have larger primary tumors, lung metastases, and less likely to have distant lymph node metastases. Um, and so this is just uh, the multivariate analysis of overall survival. Um, and they found that a whole bevy of uh, variables were significant, but chemotherapy alone was significant, um, as well as female gender, which was also seen in our particular study, comorbidities, um, and uh, treatment at a comprehensive uh, and at an academic research institution was associated with improved survival. Um, but also notably, the use of uh, liver-directed therapy was also significantly correlated with overall survival. Um, and this is just uh, the Kaplan-Meier curves looking at that. Um, they did multiple different analyses, imputing data to account for missing data, a propensity score match to adjust for imbalances within arms. So with the data, they did um, as many statistical analyses as possible to try to uh, adjust for biases. So I do think that there is some real signal out there that local therapies can impact survival in this disease. And then this is just uh, another example. This is another study that supports that in the metastatic setting. This is an MD Anderson series published in Cancer in 2017. 362 patients treated, um, the majority treated with chemotherapy alone, but 122 had resection and 85 treated with radiation. Um, and they found that patients treated with chemo uh, delivered a uh, developed liver failure at a time of death significantly more frequently than those treated with resection and radiation as well. Um, so something certainly to consider, it, it, you know, I think it depends a little bit on the location of the tumor. A peripheral lesion is less likely to cause biliary complications. Obviously, um, as anything within the, uh, closer to the hilum is gonna be more of an issue, um, but we frequently see those and those are ones that even in the, even in the setting of metastatic disease is worth considering uh, radiation for. Uh, 
Uh, and this just as it gives you a sense of cause of death. The gray is the um, death related to liver failure. And you can see that for patients treated with chemotherapy alone, 72% were related, uh, were liver failure deaths versus 41% in radiation and 30% in resection. There was no difference seen between radiation and resection in this study, but a significant difference between chemotherapy and, uh, and the other two arms. So the conclusion for current um, status of um, our uh, disease is that long-term survival with radiation is possible in unresected um, intrahepatic glandios, and that high-dose radiation with ablative intent is needed um, once again, a dose is important and a biologic effective dose of greater than 80.5 should be uh, the goal. Or, and a benefit may be even in the setting of metastatic disease um, because of the risk of biliary complications left untreated. So that uh, concludes um, current directions. Unfortunately, Dr. Hong was going to join us, but he was called away to the uh, operating room. So I'm going to be uh, talking about his portion of the uh, slides as well, which is future directions moving forward. What are some interesting clinical trials certainly uh, undergoing and where, where can we go from here? Well, so um, this was a very groundbreaking study that was published in Nature in 2015. Um, and it was a study, uh, it was a study looking and establishing the role of radiation and dual checkpoint blockade um, to activate non-redundant immune mechanisms in cancer. We know that anti-CTLA-4 predominantly inhibits Tregs um, and it increases CD8 and Treg ratio. Radiation also enhances the diversity of T cell repertory and intratumoral T cells and together uh, Anti-CDLA-4 promotes expansion of T cells while radiation shapes the TCR repertoire of the expanded peripheral cones. And the addition of PDL1 blockade reverses T cell exhaustion to mitigate depression in CDA T rate ratio and further encourages oligoclonal T cell expansion. And this suggests that the activation of non-redundant immune activation mechanisms are, uh, are at play. So this is a study um, that we recently completed and is currently um, being evaluated or, or under uh, submission, uh, where we looked at microsatellite stable colon cancer, and there were exploratory cohorts of MSI high colon cancer, as well as pancreatic cancer. Um, and I bring this up just to give you a sense of, you know, the study of combination of dual checkpoint plus radiation. And in this study, we looked at one cycle of ipinevo, and then with the second cycle of ipinevo, treating with radiation, and then uh, continuation of um, dual checkpoint blockade until time of progression. And this is um, in our pancreatic uh, pancreas cohort. Um, this is just a, a plot of uh, of response, a waterfall plot of response, and you can see that. Um, although the far majority had disease progression, there was a cohort that had stable disease or um, even one patient who had a complete response. Our disease control rate was ultimately 29% versus an overall response rate of 18%. And that is, um, you know, compared to the benchmark of um, the best known published um, response rate is 3% in a recent phase two study randomized um, that just came out in GM Oncology by Eileen O'Reilly. So um, giving a sense that uh, there really could be immune sort of activation with radiation um, with, uh, with this combination. And then this is just a swimmer's plot looking at duration of response in, in our patients. Um, and you can see that there are some patients that have had more than eight months of response in the pancreatic. Um, in our pancreatic cohort. And this is just uh, a representative patient who was treated. Um, you can see we treated the liver. This is the target lesion and it certainly shrunk over time. Uh, but in addition, the out of field, so the abscopal effect, you can see that's the immunotherapy uh, working. Or you can see that there's a shrinkage of the pulmonary metastases that were out of field. And then this is the microsatellite stable colon cohort. And you can similarly see this is also uh, historically the response rates are about 0%. And 
and you can see that there are responders in this cohort as well, generally in the teens, um, with one complete responder, and this is just the swimmers, but you can see one patient is over uh, 18 months out uh, with a partial response still on therapy. So there is some evidence uh, emerging in um, GI, but certainly as in other fields as well, that the synergy of radiation with IO can turn some otherwise cold tumors hot. And this is just a spectrum of tumors. Uh, oops, sorry. This is just a spectrum of studies that are ongoing looking at checkpoint uh, blockade in both uh, in colorectal cancer and pancreatic cancer. You can see just sort of the really dismal uh, response rates to date. And so anything we can do to try to improve that, I think is, um, is our, it's in our, our goal. Um, and so, you know, there is some evidence of activity based on our uh, experience with microsatellite stable patients, but there is some sense that sequencing does matter and that perhaps pre-treating with anti-PD-1 like we did in our prior study, doing one cycle without radiation is inducing T-cell exhaustion. And in addition, a third of the patients don't make it to radiation because they're falling out from disease progression or clinical progression with worsening performance status. So our next trial is really looking at starting with radiation at cycle one, day one. So moving to the biliary system and biliary tumors, this is an ongoing uh, study um, that was presented in ASCO. And it was both HCC and biliary tract tumors. And it was looking with dermy and Gervotremi, also with cycle one, um, just a checkpoint, a dual checkpoint um, blockade. And then with cycle two, the addition of radiation eight grade times three to a single lesion. Um, and then following it until time of progression um, with der uh, Dervalumab. This is just a patient, uh, representative patient with intrahepatic glandular that was treated on this study. Um, with dosing 24 and three fractions. And so uh, we have completed an uh, initial um, phase of the study. 15 of 15 have been enrolled. Three of 15 did not reach radiation. And on the intent to treat analysis, the disease control rate was 27% with a partial response of 14% and a complete response of 17%. When we look at just the patients uh, who re received radiation as since three did not, we find a disease control rate of 33%, a partial response of 17%, and a complete response of 8%. And historically, this is in comparison to uh, uh, overall response rate, otherwise reported in literature about 10%. So there is a proposal of perhaps moving this forward into the cooperative group setting in NRG. And this is a proposal of a randomized trial of um, radiation plus or minus Dervatremi. Um, administered in a very similar fashion to this current study. Oh, I should also mention that uh, while we finished the MGH cohort 15 or 15, we are in uh, discussions with an expansion cohort um, with, uh, with the company um, for an additional 25 patients. Um, and so this would be the IO uh, arm schedule, Derva Tremi, um, with Tremi 300 milligrams flat dose, a Derva, um, 1500 grams, uh, 1500 milligrams level dosing, four week cycle um, in a 15 fraction radiation starting day one. And this is the radiation that we had published previously in our um, JCO paper. And then cycle two and beyond, we would just do Dubrow map 1500 milligrams. So the one conclusion from, in addition to what I had already described is just that the main cause of death remains metastatic disease. And so future studies will really look to mitigate this and how to incorporate uh, immunotherapy and radiation moving forward to optimize this. So thank you very much. And I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu, and um, thanks, Dr. Uh, Hong, for joining us. So please, if you have any question, uh, submit it on the chat.
Okay, so since we don't have any uh, uh, questions, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and okay, so sorry, I just got a question. So um, this is about, uh, can you please describe margins and treatment planning for intrahepatic cholangio? Sure, um, do you want me to take this or do you want to take that? Why don't you take this, Ted? Oh, okay. I had assumed that you were taking it, but that's no problem. So, um, oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, go for it. Okay, <laughs> I can take it, sorry. Um, so, uh, so we do a 40 CT at time of the uh, radiation treatment planning. Um, motion analysis and based off the motion analysis, we determine whether or not gating is necessary. Um, you know, in terms of treatment target, uh, treatment planning volumes, um, you know, we, I, I do a gross total volume. I also do based on the 40 uh, ITV. Um, my CTV is determined a little bit based off of, um, you know, how, how confident I am, to be honest, of, um, of delineation of the tumor. Um, some lesions show up really, really nicely on, um, on CT based planning. And I can, when I fuse the MRI, it fuses really nicely. Um, and sometimes my, uh, sometimes however my contrast, the contrast phases are not um, optimally uh, obtained. And so it can sometimes be trickier to see, or if there's uh, a lot of motion movement uh, and fusion is not great, then I tend to go with a little bit larger margins. It also is a little bit dependent on what I think um, the liver reserve is, as well as the size of the lesion. Um, because once again, I, I am trying to get in as much dose as I can. If it's a larger lesion, I'll probably go with a little bit tighter margins, but my margins generally are about, about three to seven millimeters. And um, another question. So the dose is typically uh, 60 gray uh, over 15th uh, fraction. So um, we typically try for, if it's a peripheral lesion, we'll try to do 67.5 gray in 15 fractions. Um, and if it's a more centrally located lesion because of the concerns of biliary, uh, essential for biliary complications, um, from the radiation itself, if you push dose too much, we tend to do 5805 in 15 fractions. I think that works out to about 387 centigrade per day. So that's our, and obviously accounting for V effective, or, you know, there should be some uh, or spared volume of liver. So, uh, do you put any constraints on the uh, common bile duct? So, if there is any other questions from um, any of the attendees? Okay. So, thank you so much for joining us today, and um, you will get the invitation for the next uh, seminar as soon as possible. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.